It's super fun playing on my mom's cell phone. It's awesome how you can watch videos on Texting YouTube. Texting and sharing photos. Playing games on my phone. It all started with one question. What new phone to get my daughter? I knew what Tessa wanted, a smartphone. I learned that you spend on average six and a half hours a day looking at screens. As a doctor, I decided I needed to understand the impact of all this screen time on kids. And as a mom, I needed to know what to do. The young adolescent brain can oscillate back and forth very, very quickly, but it comes at a cost. I'm so distracted by my phone, so it's hard to listen to a teacher and actually understand what they're saying. What's extraordinary about the studies on multitasking is even though you're doing worse and worse on everything you're doing, you feel as though you're doing better and better. Who's there to catch you at home? Your mom? You can outsmart her easily. No, no offense. Yeah, mom, it's really hard math thing. The game industry has designed these games to become universes where these kids enter and they don't want to come out to do math. Who wants to do math? When I tried to stop him from playing the games, he turns into another person. I gamed until like one in the morning, and then I gamed three in the morning, and then I gamed until five in the morning. Most of the time, he'd be on the computer, it felt like he was in a different world. I didn't realize how much my sister cared about me. The thing that matters is not whether you're a good person, it's how you look. I took a picture of myself and my bra, and I sent it to him. When I got to school, I knew that everyone else knew. This is one of the most difficult parenting issues we've ever faced. Internet consumption, video game use is very complicated to parent around. The mistake that parents often make is that they assert their authority without explaining it in a way that makes sense to their child. When parents tell me not to do something, I'm like, what would happen if I did it? When my parents actually have that deep conversation, it works a lot better. It's evolution, it's the future, it's too late, I'm addicted. No, it's not too late. The research that shows human resiliency gives me hope. My friends and I go out to eat. We'll all agree to put our phones in the middle of the table. Whoever checks their phone first has to pay for the meal. When I study, I turn off the data on my phone and that way I can't go on the internet and I can't get text messages. We have to think about everywhere that kids are in the real world and how we can help educate them in those spaces. We can't just say it's on the schools, it's on the parents. We have to do this as a community. Overstimulation tires the brain and it tends to function not as well. Overstimulation tires the brain and it tends to function not as well. We wanted to know how does the rapid stimulation affect the brain. We exposed young mice to switching sounds and lights to mimic the situation that children face when they switch from one screen to the other. Afterwards, we looked at the effect on learning and found that the ability of these young mice to learn new things was very much compromised. It took them three times longer or more to learn how to go through a maze than the non-exposed young mice. The next step was to look at the brain of these mice, and what we found is that the structure that controls learning and memory had less nerve cells compared to those that were not stimulated. But what really surprised us is that once we stopped exposing the young mice to the screens, the reduction in the nerve cell persisted throughout their lives. The changes were permanent. We're exposing a whole generation of children to these rapid-paced media, and we have no clue what it does to the brain. And if it's the same as we see in the mice, then this is a very shocking news. That is a scary clip from the provocative new documentary, Screenagers. It's made by a mom who also happens to be a doctor, Delaney Rustin. Here's the question. If brain mice, the brain cells of mice can be permanently changed by these flashing lights and sounds, it's the same thing that happens to kids when they're exposed to their cell phones and video games. So do you think there's something similar happening in kids' brains as they have proven happen in mice brains?
Well, the reality is we can't look at kids' brains in the same microscopic way that we can in mice brains. But I can tell you that these studies are showing some concerning results. For example, if you put kids in front of similar situations and many screens like that, and then you compare them to kids who are just playing with crayons on tests that look at their academic abilities, the kids who played with crayons do a lot better. Also, there's correlations with the more screen time kids have, attention spans are going down. Yeah. We see that firsthand even in our own kids. So the thing that makes this documentary so provocative for me is that Dr. Rustin got kids to open up about technology like I have never seen before. She talks to me and then she goes back for like five minutes, then she talks to me, then she goes back, then she talks to me, then she goes back. And what do you think about that? Well, maybe she could spend a little bit less time on it. I do try, I do try to get off the phone. Is technology kind of like gives everyone some competition? Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like how pretty you are, like what the guys think of you. It's like a competition. Yeah. 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 Kind of. That you can't win, you just like, yeah. there's no finish like, line. If it yeah. gets a lot of likes too, sometimes it makes you feel good. Yeah. yeah. You're so used to getting all these likes and you put a photo with like three likes. And like, oh my gosh, delete. Yeah. I love this part. <laughs> happens to me too. Simon Sinek is here. He's part of, uh, been, been part of Dr. Rustin's investigation into how technology affects kids' brains. He's also a New York Times best-selling author and has one of the most watched TED Talks of all time, which my wife has forced me to watch several times because it is so darn good. So what is the biggest concern you have about kids and the amount of time they're looking at screens? When we're very young, the only approval we need is from our parents. And as we go through adolescence, we make this change where we now need approval from our peers. Um, it's a time of great stress and anxiety, and we're supposed to learn to rely on our friends. My fear is that if kids aren't going through this adolescence and this anxiety, they're actually not learning the coping skills that they need throughout life. They're not learning to form these deep, meaningful relationships. So are we tricking ourselves? We're focusing on addictive risks like drugs and alcohol, cigarettes. Are we missing the biggest addiction that's being formed right in front of our eyes? Without a doubt. Um, there's a chemical called dopamine in our brain. It's responsible for pleasure. It's the feeling we get when we cross something off our to-do list or find our keys or win the game, that, that sort of nice little feeling. Um, we know that dopamine is released when we have texts or engage with social media. Mm -hmm. Dopamine is the same chemical behind uh, alcohol, nicotine, and gambling. Now, we have age restrictions on alcohol, cigarettes, and gambling because we know that an immature brain cannot deal with all of this you know, stimulation, and we wait until people are old enough to do those things. But we have no such restrictions on the other dopamine-producing device that is social media and our phones. So just imagine um, these kids that's going through this anxiety of adolescence. Mm -hmm. It's as if parents are throwing open the liquor cabinet right. and inviting them. You know, I know adolescence is really stressful. Try the vodka, it works really well. <laughs> that's kind of what we're doing with cell phones. And at the end of the day, like all addiction, we're pushing away the people who are closest to us. Dr. Rustin, your daughter, she's here, Tessa's in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and she got out of school today, congratulations. Nice job. <laughs> so you've got a smartphone now, I understand. Are you happier now? Was it worth the battle? Definitely. I think there's a lot of upsides to it and a lot of excitement being able to be connected with my friends. And I mean, there are some times when I'm not as happy. Now I'm like seeing this whole other world. I'm like comparing myself to others a lot more. Yep. But it's still a lot, of, a lot of upsides. So I understand you developed an interesting compromise with Tessa mm -hmm. in order to allow her to enjoy her cell phone and the pluses that are going to go along with that, but still try to avoid some of the addictive yeah. risks uh, that Simon spoke about. I did it. I did it incorrectly at first. I have to confess, the first thing I did was to, to write out a four-page uh, contract for her. A contract? <laughs> yes. And it was so much about talking to her, about finding compromises about when she should be off of her phone that we came up together. And all of these things are really about helping her to find balance in her life with all this technology. Listen, I think you did a wonderful job with this. Let me offer some final thoughts. Stopping kids from using tech like smartphones, video games, actually it's not gonna prepare them for the real world anyway. So it's not really a rational thing to do. But I do love this idea of creating a different kind of relationship with technology in general. So if you're looking for some simple ways to do this, I'll share what I have done, which sort of overlaps. I didn't have the kids sign a contract. Maybe I'll do that now. We don't let the kids uh, have the cell phones in the bedrooms. I'd rather they be next to me if they're gonna be doing anything anyway. So force them out of their bedrooms, 
chase them out. You set a screen time curfew, and there's no technology ever allowed at our dinner tables. The one time I want to allow that vulnerability that Simon spoke of to really sing forward so we can truly connect. It's training for life. If you have a teenager or simply see them walking down the street, you know how hooked they are to their cell phones. So we wondered what would happen if we took those phones away? If I don't know where my phone is for like 10 minutes, I start to like freak out. For me, getting that little buzz is kind of like an adrenaline rush. These are 10th graders in world history class at Black Hills High School in Washington State. The school bans phones during class. But let's just say it seems a rule made to be broken. All right, phones away, guys. I need you to put that away right now, please. Hey, hey, phones away. Before we came, we asked these students to track their phone usage. Listen to these totals for a single day. Six hours and 38 minutes. Four hours and 26 minutes. I'm over nine hours, and that was just on one day. The class just watched the movie Screenagers, a documentary that explores teens' obsession with their digital devices. The film's producers helped identify this school to conduct a little experiment. Would these students give up their phones for a week? Uh, no, no way. There's no way. But with some arm twisting, nine brave students agreed. Here were the ground rules. No smartphones, no gaming, laptops for schoolwork only, and no social media. I think I can do it. I'm not really that scared. I'm probably going to suffer a lot. No, video games is kind of kind of going to be not so fun for me. Honestly, I want to go back home. <laughs> like, and just not do it. We did give them flip phones for emergencies. Flip phones. <laughs> it's a Samsung flip phone, like grandpa's. All right, no access to social media. No Facebook, no Instagram, no Snapchat. Everyone clear? Then the moment of truth. <sighs> As we suspected, video diaries show a jarring start. I'm going insane. I'm already really bored. Kind of sucks. None of my friends are answering their phone. But a few days in, we saw changes. So far, I have done most of my chores. I started reading a book, like, last night. I'm getting a lot more homework done. During the week, I actually learned a song on my guitar. It's made me hang out with family more often. And so it's, it's been nice. Honestly. But not so nice that they weren't happy when the week was over. Last day of the detox, thank God. If you could, one to ten, how excited are you to get back online? That scale's broken. <laughs> Here they are. What if I said to you right now you have to do another week? I'm going to sign up for that. No, no <laughs> okay. Brandon. I'm so happy. Yay. Oh, my gosh. I have yes. over 60 missed messages. I have over, like, 100 Instagram. So, Elena, with that many missed messages, are you feeling anxious to check them? Or you I'm, like, freaking out. This guy thinks I blocked him because I wasn't texting him. What was the toughest thing for you this week? And the toughest thing was to see other people on the phones. It was a different perspective. And, like, I guess I should, like, start not going on the phone as much. Did anyone else feel something similar? Like, God, I really do spend too much time on it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, almost sure. everyone nodded. The teens told us they were more present. Without my phone, it's like I'm more engaged, like actually in the moment. I went to dinner with my family, and um, I didn't have my phone, so we really just like talked the whole time, and that was nice. How about anyone else with their relationship with their parents? I was paying attention, and I was like ready for someone to talk to me. So you, you heard them? Yeah. It was actually kind of nice being able to actually talk to people because when you get a text, you have to sit there and go, how did they mean that? All right, so who cheated? Come on. Honestly? Honestly, complain. But it was emergency complain. reasons, One, honestly. Two. 
three, four. I did think about it, but my parents would not let me. So on the little flip phones, you can get like games on them. <laughs> okay, so that's cheating. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> Their teacher, Dave Haywood, kept close tabs on the experiment. So with some of these kids, you actually saw a physical effect. Yeah, behavior changes, you know, uh, noticeable behavior changes. Some were withdrawn, some were outgoing. And he was impressed with how reflective the students were. Students are really self-observant. They really understand how the phones control them. And I think a week without their phone, in a way, really freed them. You're glad you twisted their arms. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this project gets an A. So we've checked back with the students after the experiment. Most have returned to their old habits. Others say they've changed. One leaves her phone at home more and puts it away during homework. Another turns his in to his parents at night. Interestingly, almost all the kids said their parents give them a hard time with the phone, but then they turn around and they use their phones as much, if not more, than they do. And, you know, healthy true. parental absolutely. double standard, right? It's yeah. absolutely true, and maybe in my house, too. Yeah, I was just thinking as I was watching it, I mean, it's not a teen problem. No. It's an yeah. all of us problem. Could we give it up for a week? When I, when I walk my dog, I actually leave my phones home, and it's just such a nice 20 minutes of no phone. Yeah. Can't do anything about it. It's at home. And your what dog was, probably likes it, too. Yeah. Yeah. What was really cool was how thoughtful those kids were in the end. Mm -hmm. They talked to their parents. They read a book. Yeah. You know, Play and guitar. they talked. I love that. Yeah. 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 Cool. Right, Stephanie, thank you very yeah. much. Okay, so I know we all just met, but I want you to all do something terrifying. Something so nerve-wracking that it might literally shake you to the core, make you question all of your beliefs, it might trigger a full-blown panic attack, you may even lose your breakfast. I want you all for a moment to imagine that you are 13 again. <laughs> exactly. Does it, do you remember what it was like to be 13? <laughs> Does anyone here want to remember being 13? <laughs> that time in your life of constant anxiety and pressure to fit in, when we were all trying on new and different identities almost every day, doing our best to avoid bullies, not get called on by the teacher, or even worse, do something the whole school might find out. Now, as you're imagining your 13-year-old self, right, with the puku shells and the gerbo jeans. <laughs> with a social and emotional and a psychological state more fragile than it's ever been your entire life. I want you to imagine that your mom hands you a smartphone with untethered access to social media. <laughs> a couple months ago, I was standing in front of 500 middle schoolers and I handed them a, a, a no card. And I said, fill in the following question. One thing my parents don't know about social media is what? and I would like to share a couple of their responses. <laughs> it's just a fun way to talk to my friends. One thing my parents don't know about social media is that no one really cares about anything. <laughs> one thing my parents don't know about social media is how much I love it and I hate it at the same time. One thing my parents don't know is that they're blocked. <laughs> And I love this one. One thing my parents don't know is how fake it is. Truthfully, I've never really struggled with the fakeness of Instagram, but my mom sure does. <laughs> the, the, the responses were not so positive. The majority of them, sadly, were actually a lot more grim. One thing my parents don't know about social media is how addictive and how awful it is. One thing my parents don't know is that it makes me very, very, very insecure. Social media makes me sad and depressed. It puts pressure on me to be perfect. It nearly ended my life. Today in our country and across the globe, we are seeing an epidemic rise in the levels of anxiety and depression and suicidality among our teenagers. Right here in the state of Utah, in just the last seven years, our suicide rate among kids aged 10 to 17 has jumped 
And not 30 minutes from where we're standing right now, last school year, in an affluent community of Harriman, Utah, at one school, eight kids took their life. I want to share with you a message I got from a couple ER docs. One was here in, uh, in Salt Lake, one in Oregon. The one in Oregon said, Colin, every pediatric suicide attempt and completion, the kids will attribute to one of two things. Number one, my parent took my phone. Number two, cyberbullying on social media. He said, we recently had a girl, a suicide completion, who overdosed on over-the-counter medication simply because dad took her phone. She was 11. An ER doc at Salt Lake told me this. He said, we recently had a girl, a suicide attempt, because she found out her parents said, you're going to summer camp for a month, kayaking and fishing and hiking with a bunch of teenagers for a whole month. And you can't bring your phone, by the way. And when she heard that, with no mental health history, she lashed out, slashed her wrist and her thighs. And she needed 27 stitches. And the doctor said, Colin, we were only semi-shocked. We see this every day. Experts say that handing a smartphone with social media and untethered access to these apps with no training or, no, or guidance is like handing them the keys to a car with no driver's ed. So how do we sit here in shock, wondering why kids are crashing and burning every single day? I'm going to share this message right here. The best friend of the eighth victim at Harriman sent me this the day after he died. She said, Colin, we're not 100% sure as to why he chose to end his life at such a young age, but I know for a fact, 100%, that social media had something to do with it. I hate that social media does this to us. People, including myself, need to make sure that what we're sharing promotes positivity and not toxic perfectionism. Dr. Jean Twenge wrote a book called iGen, where she studied thousands of teenagers and the effect that screen time and social media have on their mental health. And she said this, she said, we are on the verge of the greatest public health crisis this generation has ever seen. That was two years ago. We are no longer verging. <laughs> the verge is here. I'd like to share one more message from a teenage girl. She said, Colin, I got a phone when I was 11 and got social media right then. How crazy is that? Everything evil was at my fingertips. Accounts on my feed that promoted pornography, self-harm, anorexia. It destroyed me. I was hooked. She said, I wish my parents would have monitored me so they could have saved me from this darkness. I dealt with suicide attempts, anxiety, depression, anorexia, all because of social media. It took away my innocence. It taught me to hate who I am today. Smartphones and social media, when we hand them to our kids, it is literally stealing their joy. It's robbing them from the ability to create and feel real connection. Instead of dealing with their emotions and their feelings head on, kids are just scrolling their phones to numb their pain and their feelings, which is robbing them of resiliency. Spending time on platforms like Instagram and Snapchat when you're 13 just teach you that you'll never be enough. You'll never be skinny enough or pretty enough or good enough. That your worth isn't inherent, but it's contingent upon virtual likes, follower counts, filters, and streaks. This 24-7 constant access to peer culture is opening up a door and a wave of cyberbullying and social anxiety that we have never seen. And kids today are choosing to self-harm as a coping mechanism and as a way to get attention more than we've ever seen before. Just last week in the UK, they released a research, a study, that said that one out of four children aged 14 are self-harming, citing pressure from social media to be perfect as the cause. And a pediatrician right here in Utah, he said, Colin, 10 years ago, our typical day was treating kids who had, who had tonsillitis and flus and colds and fevers. But now, me and all of my peers, we've had to hire full-time social workers and psychiatrists to work on site because we cannot keep up with this epidemic. And of course, cyberbullying has become a huge crisis. Our kids' entire self-worth at 13 is determined by virtual, unpredictable feedback. The validation that we all crave to them is only available in this synthetic way. 
their social standing, and their self-esteem is determined by a like on an Instagram photo. And one mistake, one tiny gaffe that we all made as 13-year-olds every day, that when we were kids was forgotten in an hour, is now publicly housed on the school Snapchat page. When you're 13 today, there is no place to run. There's no escape. And it is soul-crushing. So what is the answer? How do we save the kids from this screen-induced public health crisis? Yes, we have to have tough conversations about what is the proper age to hand our children this technology and these devices. We have to look at countries like France as examples who just passed a bill this year banning smartphones from public schools nationwide. It's time that we start talking to the tech education companies who have duped school boards and school administrators into the notion that screen-based learning is only for the child's benefit when the research is starting to prove otherwise. We have to stand up to the big tech companies who are creating products and games and apps that are deliberately exploiting and manipulating our kids, all for insane profit. We have got to put on the brakes and ask them tough questions. But the answer of how do we save these kids is that we can't until we first save ourselves. We as adults and as parents, we have to break free from our screen dependency and our social media addiction. We have to start modeling healthy digital behavior for our kids who don't hear us, they see us. We have to teach them from our example that our worth, that our self-esteem doesn't depend on likes on a photo. We have to teach them from our example that it's okay to show the world that we're not okay, that we all feel alone and inadequate, that sometimes the day just sucks. And we can share that, even though social media has taught us not to. We have to be more aware of how our digital behavior is affecting our kids. I want to share one more message from a 13-year-old girl. She said, Colin, I grew up with the typical good parents. They gave me everything I needed physically. But now that I'm a teenager, I have never felt more distant. And it's not because of me, who you'd think is a teenager. It's because I can't get my mom and dad off their stupid phone. I can't get them to get off Facebook and Instagram to ask me about my day or talk to me about my feelings. I have never felt more unloved and uncared for all because of a stupid phone. Eight months ago, one of my four kids, or crypods as I call them, <laughs> um, my 10-year-old was really struggling. She was acting defiance all the time, and she, at home she was just mad, and I didn't know why. And the confusing part is we went to parent-teacher conference, and the teacher said, your daughter is a total angel. She's the best child in class. In fact, I'm going to give her an award for the most helpful students. My wife and I looked at ourselves, we're like, do you have two Quincy's? <laughs> One day after work, I came home and she was yelling at her sister, hitting her brother, yelling at her mom. She's 10. She went into the bedroom and slammed the door and I lost it. I walk into the room and I go, what is wrong? Why are you so mad? Why are you doing such good things at school, but you're making such bad choices at home? And this little precious human being looked at me and with tears in her eyes, she said, why do you love your phone more than you love me? That was the only wake-up call I needed. I set a rule for myself right there. That from that point on, my kids would never see me on a phone. Ever. If we went to a t-ball game or we went to a dance recital, they would see my eyes at them, not looking down at a screen. I even went and bought one of these. Have you guys seen these? Do you know what this is? Oh, gosh. You can make a call, you can end a call, you can do that. There's so much functionality. And I take it with me when I go home. So there's literally no distractions. When I get home from work now, instead of pulling out my phone and sitting on the couch and scrolling the endless void of Twitter or checking emails, I put my phone in a drawer. I grab that little tiny human, I sit her on my lap, and I ask her, how was your day? And as she's telling me, I try my best to not even blink. 
One thing amazing happened when I did this. All of the defiance and the anger stopped right then because she felt love and connection. I realized at that moment that when I had my phone out in front of my kids, she didn't know that I was answering emails to make money so she could go to dance, right? She didn't know that I was talking to clients so we could go to Disneyland one day. She didn't know that I was crushing virtual candy. (laughs) The only thing she saw was when this was out in front of her is that that means more to my dad than I do. Kids today are amazing. I talk to thousands every month. They're incredible. They are resilient. They are bright. They are savvy. They are tolerant. (laughs) But they are growing up in a world that is muckier and scarier than any of us could ever imagine. And they need now more than ever from you and me to be seen, to be heard, and to be loved. And if they don't get that from home, because our eyes are down here, they can get a pretty good synthetic version of that on their screen. So, for the people who are saying, when is the appropriate age to give little Johnny a cell phone? When do I give Johnny a smartphone? My reply is always, when are you okay with him to start looking at pornography? When should I get little Katie an Instagram account? My reply is, when are you okay with her to start feeling anxiety and question her self-worth? Because the minute we hand our kids these devices is the time they stop being a kid. So for the parents out there who feel stuck, who feel like your son or daughter is too far gone down this rabbit hole, let me offer some hope. In February, I got a message from a mom. Oh, there's my daughter. (laughs) Let me just say this. Instantly, everything changed. We went from defiant daughter and disengaged daddy to best friends. This mom sent me this message. She said, Colin, we had to take our daughter to the ER because she was suicidal and she's now in a mental health facility. This is a parent's biggest nightmare. I have 100% know it's because of Instagram, Snapchat, text messaging, and social media. That's why we're here. She struggled with anxiety and depression since seventh grade, oddly enough, when we gave her a smartphone. I waited two months, and when she got back to me, I said, what happened? She said, all we did was we took her off social media. That's it. This is what happened. She said she ended all of her toxic relationships on her own. She tells me she loves me all the time. She says she's happy all the time. Her future goals have changed. She's not anxious to move out. Her grades have improved. She has more confidence. She looks and acts differently. She's even taken responsibility. She is 17. It is never too late to step up and be a parent. So the answer, how do we save the kids from this screen-induced public health crisis they're in, is that we have to first save ourselves and reconnect with them. So if this message hasn't inspired you, I hope it's at least opened your eyes a little bit. My challenge to you is tonight when you go home is to put your phone in a drawer. Grab that little human who lives in your home, who eats all your food, Plop her on your lap. Ask her how her day was. And as she's telling you, try to not even blink. Thank you. Thanks. (laughs) Thank you. This is Because I Said So, parenting advice with love and leadership from the nation's leading parenting expert, John Roseman, syndicated columnist, author, conference speaker, and the only psychologist to point out that psychology has caused more problems than it has solved. From American Family Radio, here's your host, John Roseman. Welcome to the show, folks. It's called Because I Said So, and I'm your host, John Roseman. You can find out more about me, my books, 
My syndicated newspaper column and my upcoming speaking engagements, which take place uh, hither and yon uh, all across America, primarily August through May, by going to my website, John Rosemond, J O H N R O S E M O N D dot com. Uh, the show is all about parenting, parenting, and I'm a very traditional, biblically based guy. Nothing new from me because I don't believe that there is concerning children or raising them properly anything new under the sun. I believe that the Bible is the only book we need in order to raise children properly. We need to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, and he will direct our paths appropriately. And uh, so I go around the country nine months a year more or less uh, coincident with the school year. And I try to keep traditional, biblically-based parenting alive in America. That is my ministry, and that is my mission. And <clears throat> I do a variety of presentations. I do 90-minute presentations. I do three-hour, I call them seminars. And then I do full-day seminars, and then sometimes I do two-day small group seminars. I call those parent retreats. And anyway, you can go to my website and find out more about all of that. Question from a the mother of a 12-year-old. Our 12-year-old has a smartphone. I know you don't approve. No, I don't. But all and I do mean all of his friends have them, and texting is how they communicate. Yes, I know that too. I don't think under the circumstances, and this is the mother now speaking, that making him be the odd man out socially is a good idea, and she puts odd man out in quotation marks. I don't think under the circumstances that making him be the odd man out socially is a good idea. So our question, do we have a right to monitor his cell phone communications? Some of his friends' parents do, while others don't feeling that doing so indicates a lack of trust. What do you think? Okay. While you are correct, I don't approve of 12-year-olds having cell phones. And to the question, John, when should my child have a cell phone? My answer is when he can pay for it and pay the monthly bill. That's when he should, if he wants one, have a cell phone. But here's my answer to the mother when she says, do we have a right to monitor his phone communications? Some of his friend's parents do, while others don't, feeling that doing so indicates a lack of trust. What do you think? Oh, what I think in general is that parents who buy an expensive technological toy for a child, primarily because all his friends have one, have lost a firm grip on common sense. But then, as Rush Limbaugh recently said, common sense is on the wane in America today, in every sphere, in every facet of American existence. Yes, I think parents who buy an expensive toy for a child on the basis of the fact that all his friends have one are common sense challenged. Toy, John? Toy? A cell phone is not a toy. Oh, yes, it is. It's a toy in the hands of a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old or a 16-year-old. It's a toy. Your smartphone is not a toy. My smartphone is not a toy. My wife's cell phone is not a toy. You, 
I, my wife, we use our cell phones for legitimate communication, essential purposes. I use mine primarily for work-related situations, for example, as well as calling my wife, calling my son, calling my daughter, calling my grandchildren, calling my friends, arranging appointments, and so on and so forth. My cell phone is not a toy. My wife's cell phone is not a toy. Your son's cell phone is a toy. It is a toy because your son uses his phone primarily for entertainment, for superfluous, completely non-essential purposes. Therefore, his cell phone, by definition, is a toy, period. It is not sort of, kind of a toy, sometimes a toy. It is a toy. All right, that's my feeling number one. My feeling number two is, so what if all of his friends have smartphones? Who cares? Well, I'll tell you who cares. Your son cares. But who, beyond your son, cares? Children, including those in high school, by the way, do not need Smartphones, they have them because they want them. I'll say that again. Children, including those in high school, do not need smartphones. No parent in America has ever been able to logically justify that their child has a cell phone because of a legitimate need All of their explanations when I ask, why does your child have a cell phone? They all boil down to, well, all of his friends have one. I mean, John, that's the way they communicate these days. Blah, 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 blah. In other words, they have them because they want them. Just like when I was a teenager, I wanted my own telephone because a lot of my friends had their own telephones in their rooms. Their parents had put telephones into their rooms, giving them their own phone lines. This was in the day of hard lines, folks, because they were tired of going to use the phone and finding their child on the phone when they needed to use the phone for an essential purpose and their child was using the phone for a non-essential purpose for completely recreational and entertainment purposes. And so... Instead of dealing with the issue, authoritatively, they gave in to their children and put their own phone lines in their room. So I wanted a phone line in my room, too, because most of my friends had phone lines in their rooms. And my parents said, if all of your friends jumped off a cliff, would you follow them? And I said, what does that have to do with it? Jumping off a cliff, I'm talking about a phone. And my parents said... Well, then let us answer your question directly. The answer is no, you're not going to get a phone. But why? Because I said so. And that was the end of the discussion. So today's kids have phones because they want them. And they have parents who, like my friend's parents, when faced with the choice between doing the sensible thing and what a child wants them to do, choose the latter You want your child or teen to have a means of contacting you in certain situations? Fine, I'm all for that. Go to a big box store, Walmart, Target, buy them a flip phone, register it, put some minutes on it, give it to said child or teen, selectively, only on those occasions when you want him to be able to get in touch with you at a moment's notice, and vice versa. Buy a phone. Give it to him selectively. He's leaving the house, hand him the phone and say, call me if you need to. Bada bing, bada boom. As for the idea that a child without a smartphone will be, as you put it, the odd man out, that's simply not true. Over the past five or so years, many parents have told me their kids don't have smartphones and won't until they can pay for them themselves, including the monthly bill. All of the kids in question have friends All of the kids in question are socially active. They do not spend their weekends curled up in fetal positions, sucking their thumbs. 
Social skills determine whether a child has friends, not a smartphone. And if you haven't noticed where children and teens are concerned, social skills and smartphones are incompatible. In fact, these devices do kids very little good and a lot of bad. They become obsessions, addictions, and by the way, the research indicates that they actually induce changes in the brain that mimic the type of changes in the brain that are brought about by other addictions. They become impediments to proper socialization, conversation, in other words, during the years that are critical to the formation of social skills. In addition, too many youngsters use their smartphones for inappropriate purposes, especially boys. But you already know that, therefore your question, should we monitor our son's phone communications? On that note, yes, you have a right to monitor. You are the adults. You support your son. In the final analysis, the phone in question is yours, not his. You are loaning it to him. Get straight about that. He needs to be aware of that as well. But also allow me to point out that if a child knows his parents are going to check his texts and the numbers he's been calling, he is going to erase them or find a way around their attempts to do so. For that reason, my question to you what were you thinking? Actually, I know what you were thinking. You were thinking that a 12-year-old knows what is in his own best interest. Hello? Is there anybody out there? Those of you who are, stay with us. Be right back. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for staying with us. I'm John Roseman, your host. And uh, my website's John Roseman, J-O-H-N-R-O-S-E-M-O-N-D.com. If you want to find out more about me, my books, syndicated newspaper column, public speaking events, and so on. I have said many times uh, in, in the show that I am a renegade psychologist. I do hold a license to practice psychology from the North Carolina Psychology Board and um, intend to keep holding on to it, uh, by the way. Although I don't believe in psychology, I think it's a secular religion that you believe in by faith, but I enjoy being a psychologist and being a burr in the side of my profession. And the following question and my answer to it is indication of why my colleagues, by and large, there are exceptions, uh, but they are few and far between, don't like me. I am bad for business. Anyway, here's the question, and, and you'll see that in a moment. Question comes from a mother. My nine-year-old daughter is having anxiety issues that seem to border on obsessive-compulsive disorder. Mom's been going to the Internet too much. She wants me to repeat certain things back to her and has a set routine of things I must say when I'm tucking her into bed. She's genuinely upset by all of this and tells me she thinks there's something wrong with her. I'd say it was something she can't control, but she does not do this when she's alone with my husband. I've talked to her. I've tried ignoring her. I've refused to cooperate with her demands, and I've even yelled, all to no avail. Could she have obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, at this age? And if so, does she need medication? What can we do to help her? All right, well, first of all, I, I can't do a long-distance diagnosis. Furthermore, I'm of the experienced and very well-read opinion that psychiatric diagnosis concerning a child these age is rarely helpful, and I mean rarely, like one out of a thousand, maybe. And 
the risks of psychiatric medication with a child often outweigh the benefits. And I'm talking child, preteen, teen. These drugs are dangerous. That's why they are restricted by prescription. Don't ever let them tell you or any doctor tell you this drug is safe. These drugs are not safe. They are central nervous system stimulants, some of them. They are central nervous system depressants, some of them. In any case, they alter the functioning of the central nervous system and the brain in sometimes very unpredictable ways, depending on the child. And oftentimes, these modifications and alterations are even life-threatening. I do not diagnose, I do not ever recommend medication. Now, those are not opinions supported by the majority of my colleagues. So if you, mom, feel the need for a face-to-face -face evaluation in your daughter, of your daughter's issues, then by all means, I encourage you to pursue one. Parentheses, go ahead, waste your money. End of parentheses. In a situation of this sort, second and even third opinions can sometimes, occasionally, maybe, but not very often, be helpful. Because all the mental health professions do these days, it seems, is test, diagnose, and medicate. Based on slightly more than 100 words of information you provided, but more than 40 years of experience with emotional and behavioral issues of childhood, my sense is that your daughter does not have a mental disorder that can be objectively determined that she is exhibiting the behaviors in question only with you. And by the way, if you go to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the Diagnostic Bible of the Mental Health Professions, and you go to Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, you're going to find a description that to some degree matches the behaviors your daughter is exhibiting and behaviors that many mental health professionals would use to diagnose obsessive compulsive disorder in a nine-year-old and recommend a potent psychiatric medication. But the fact that your daughter is exhibiting the behaviors in question only with you, not her father or anyone else, suggests that your relationship with your daughter, and don't take this the wrong way, has developed or is developing co-dependent aspects defined as a lack of emotional boundary. That's what codependency is all about. Codependency is all about a relationship between two people in which there is no emotional boundary. In this case, and codependency in the mother-child relationship in America is rampant. It is epidemic these days, folks. It boils down to this, what the child feels, the mother feels. The mother cannot separate herself from anything the child feels. She personalizes it and feels that it is her job to solve the problem. So today's mothers just don't say to their children, as I would say to a child in a situation like this, well, child of mine, I, I don't know what you're going to do because I'm not going to cooperate with you telling me to repeat things over and over and over again. I'm just not going to do that. So I don't know how you're going to handle these feelings that you have, but I'm not going to cooperate with them. And by the way, if you need to cry because I'm not going to cooperate, that's just fine. I will leave you alone so that you can cry by yourself because actually listening to your crying is quite irritating to me. I don't want to listen to it, and I'm not going to. And with that, I would get up and leave the room. And some people may listen to that and go, Oh, oh, John, oh, how cold-hearted of you. No, it's not. That's loving. That's helping the child get over it. This child needs to get over this problem 
get a grip on it and get over it as quickly as possible. It is the loving, and I'm not suggesting that this mother does not love her child. But when you are in a codependent relationship with a child, there is a blur between enabling and love. That is always the case. And that is what I suspect in this relationship here. My daughter began, you know, for, uh, the other thing to consider here, folks, is that almost all children at one time or another during their childhoods exhibit psychiatric symptoms of any of one sort or another. I mean, the number of symptoms listed in this in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is mind boggling. Almost every child has exhibited psychiatric symptoms or a cluster of them at one time or another. That doesn't mean the child has a mental disorder or disease. Most of the stuff, I would estimate 90% of it is transient. And the other 10% would have been transient had the parents just dealt with it in a very matter-of-fact but supportive way. For example, my daughter, when she was around 12, Every night when I would tuck her in, she wanted me to tuck her in, would tell me that she was afraid of dying. So she was obsessing about dying. And I just looked at her, and the first time she, you know, said this, I said, well, you know, Amy, you, children your age, sometimes they think of thoughts like that. And, and uh, you know, you're 12 years old, and you don't have completely... You haven't developed complete control of your thoughts yet, just like you haven't developed complete control of your behavior. You're still somewhat impulsive at times. I've told you that. And your thoughts are the same way. They're sometimes impulsive. And sometimes your brain generates thoughts that are kind of weird. And that's what happens when you are a child. You're still immature. You haven't developed complete control over your thinking and uh, so uh, I'm not concerned that you are thinking a lot about death, and you shouldn't be either. Kissed her goodnight, walked out of the room. And I had to repeat that a couple of times to her over the next week or so. Daddy, I'm still, you know, thinking about death. I said, well, I told you what I think about it. I told you it's perfectly normal. And within a week, week and a half, it was gone. But you see, if I had been in a codependent relationship with her, where I would not have been able to separate my own feelings from hers. I would have become anxious. I would have communicated my anxiety to her. I would have started a long-winded explanation, questions, conversation, you know, and I would have verified that there was something wrong. Instead, I simply shrugged it off. And within a week or two, she had shrugged it off as well. And by the way, she remembers that. And she thanks me for that today. And by the way, and she says, Daddy, when you said that, I thought, you know, you, you were kind of being cold and, and you didn't care. But I realize now what you were doing and, and you did the right thing. You know, the fact of the matter is that children do odd, strange things at times. Uh, more often than not, and especially if they're handled calmly and confidently, these quirky little things, they come and go. Sometimes they may even look psychiatric in nature, but usually they're nothing more than an example of life's inevitable glitches. But I want to tell you, you take something like this to a mental health professional, and he is going to test, diagnose, and medicate, test, diagnose, and medicate. That's all they do. That's all they do. There are exceptions, but they are rare. So anyway, it's been another Because I Said So with your host, John Roseman, American Family Radio, every Saturday, 5 o'clock Central Time. Hope you join us next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>